Welcome to our penultimate lecture in the Dawn of the Data Age series. I'm pretty excited about this one today because my real passion is economics, data science, and research are things that have developed out of that, but really at the core I consider myself an economist. And so I'm really excited to share how a distilled version of this theory can be applied in daily business life because it is, as you'll see, the business world is half of the models that economists study. I'm Luciano Pesci. I'm the founder and CEO of Imperitas. I'm also the founder and director of the Utah Community Research Group at the University of Utah, where I teach econ classes. As usual, we'll have three parts to the lecture today. First, I'm going to talk about the benefits of using economics in business. Why would you do this? And if you are working in a business role right now, you may have applied to something that said that you could have had a business degree or an econ degree, that they were equivalents. It is a highly useful thing in business. Then I'm going to go into specific economic ap approaches, things like game theory, uh, things like competitive intelligence, why you would be doing these from an economic standpoint. And then I'm going to end with a, a few principles that I think will help you start to think like an economist. It is a, mind, a mindset, a way of looking at the world, and get you on that path if you're interested, including some source material, like in some of the past recent lectures, at the end, I'll provide a source that I think it's a video this time that I think you should watch. It takes about 10 minutes, and it gives you the big picture of economics. Good place to start. So the benefits of econ and business. The number one thing is that this is the real world. Economics is not just a theory, and sometimes it's a business theory, sometimes it's a social science theory. It moves beyond that. It's been tested, it's been validated and invalidated. It's a very empirical in nature. It is trying to accurately describe what is happening around us. And you could be lured by looking at the modern world today into believing that this is how it's always been. And that is not at all the case. You only have to go back 100 years and it is such a different picture. But you go back 250 years and this is the tail end of the remnants of feudalism, kingships, monarchies, and the beginning of a commercial class that is tied to international trade and all of the benefits that ends up bringing to the societies. And in economics, we call this a natural experiment. Something shifted in the world. We know that there were these big social institutions before it, specifically around things like labor and production and farming and all the technological systems of that and the history of that. And we know that 250 years ago, something fundamentally changed. And it is what most what today economists study is that 250 year progression and that's because in real terms meaning the quality of life from a whole bunch of different measures could be health could be wealth could be uh, height height is one of those things that some economists study because it's tied to food it's a net metric it doesn't matter it could be consumer goods it could be the lack of seeing a family member die because the medical system saves their life on any of those measures, if you take the totality of them, best estimate, conservative estimate is that the quality of real living has gone up a hundredfold in that 250 years. And so that's why this period is studied. And it's because it's also spread. It started in very specific pockets of the world. And it has, like no other system, spread to the entire world. It fought for quite a while, actually, throughout the Cold War with a different ideological system that ties back to a different economist in the same period of time in this 250 the beginning of the 250 year window, two very different world systems. One that was based on the market economics that I'm going to talk about today came out victorious. But this is a set of lenses that you look through the world. So economists, like any other field, they have their beliefs, they have their biases. It is a specific way of looking at the world. It doesn't always look at it from a moral standpoint. Often it's just looking at it from a price and quantity standpoint. What's happening in markets? This is why economists have studied a lot of illicit markets, drug markets, because they just want to see how they function. They remove themselves, in many cases, from the moral aspect of the analysis, which allows them to paint a very uniform picture of the world. It's very, it attempts to be very fair and objective. And so it's a very valuable lens to look through the world. I believe it is the most valuable just because by the nature of what you're studying, these, it's these systems, you then have to spread out to all the connections. You have to understand all the dependencies, all the different 
players in that system. And it's a very high level connected way of looking at things, which just turns out to be really predictive when you start to try to do data modeling. And you may have in your high school or even college, or maybe some of you are economists, had some econ classes and it usually always starts with this. Economics is the study of people who are forced to exchange because they can't supply everything they need on their own. And they're under these technological constraints. Often the technological constraint is just to explain the scarcity. There's just not enough of everything we want to go around. Well, that's actually a technical problem. That's not an actual resource problem because if we can just get off this planet, there's a literal infinite number of resources available. And the first ones that you're going to see in the next decade or two that start to actually contribute to what we call global, global product. So we do GDP at the national level, but this is like the Earth domestic product. Resources from outside asteroids specifically are going to bring in metals and waters and fertilizers and all kinds of things and open up pathways into space. That's going to be a totally different kind of economy and scarcity in that environment is not the same thing as what we talk about with scarcity today. So it's a technological issue. But to conceptualize this, the overall framework that economists use is the circular flow. And you may have seen this. You've got firms on one side. These are the businesses. And they're hiring the individuals who are on the other side of this market, on the right side. And if, if it was one closed system, there wouldn't be government or the world. The firms and the households, which are effectively just the people, would continue to exchange in this way, trading some labor or other goods for other services. And it's all supposedly happening in a very mutual, beneficial way where everybody's got clear information about what's going on. But the world's more complicated, so you interject the government. You, inter you have to deal with the fact that you have national borders now, so then you're talking about one nation versus another nation on the same planet. And I was just making the argument that you're going to have multiple planets soon. There are all these dividing lines, but it's still one system. So all you're trying to figure out is how do these individual players, which for the most part are firms, individuals, which they'll call consumers, and the government, and very very little of most econ that you would have taken in those kind of classes that I've talked about is going to do much with international trade, even though now today that is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Now, put yourself in the context of this system. You, as an individual in an organization, no matter how big your organization is, it doesn't matter if you're Walmart with a million employees or you're a tech company with 500 employees and a billion dollars in revenue, you are a teeny tiny little part of this entire global system. It is tens of trillions. No one even really has a good guess. 80 trillion has been a number I've seen floating around recently about how much total output the 7 billion humans on the planet are producing. So all goods and services in the earth. 80 trillion is a lot. So your 1 billion is a tiny little grain of sand in that giant economic beach on all the shores of all these oceans where this trade is going on. And I point out that circular system because economists will just, any it doesn't matter how refined the modeling gets, there is always the process of then stepping back and putting it in context of that bigger picture. So what is our customer like in context of all customers in our industry and what are customers like in our vertical and how is our vertical connected to one half of the of the business market rather than just looking at what did our customers say it's stepping back to that high level and looking at all those connections and dependencies and in business parlance we call this b2b or b2c those are the first two big dividing groups if you're a firm if you're not a household or the government and you're a firm there's really two ways you can be a firm you can either be a business that sells to other businesses and often those businesses are directly interacting with a consumer. Or you could be a company that just sells directly to a consumer. And we call those two things B2B, B2C. That's the first immediate within firms. Now we can refine it down even one more level. And then in those two halves of the, of the market, you can look at verticals. Economists call them sectors. And if you want to look at the data, there's a lot of publicly available government data on sector performance. So if you know your vertical, you can get national data that's being tracked by the government about what is happening in that entire sector. 
And then within each vertical, you'll have a set of competitors. And these competitors, the, the nature of the competition can vary all the way from total cooperation. They are on the books, a competitor, but you share work, you share employees. This is not uncommon in emerging industries where it's very hard or there's a lot of upfront costs. They'll share them across organizations by creating partnerships or these kinds of dependencies. Or it could just be straight up someone you don't even want to talk to and what you're going to do is make sure you understand them completely so you can put them out of business because you think that they're doing it wrong and you want to do it the right way. So competition does not necessarily mean cutthroat, although that can be a part. And I say that because market economics, despite this hundredfold increase in the quality of real living, despite the fact that if you just look around outside, it is a pretty marvelous world that's being created. There are many problems. There were many problems before it. But the last 250 years have been clear that this system that economists study, the market system, provides goods at huge scale with huge consistency, with lots of transparency, and it's all being done without a central planner. This is what Adam Smith called the invisible hand. Nobody tells trucking company A what to do from a central location about ensuring that they know exactly where to go and make the economy perfect. No one does that. The government, even in its attempts, it's still a passive, in many cases, force when it's pushing up against the actual market. You can watch this right now in cryptocurrency. Technology, I'll make this case in a bit, technology always progresses faster than laws. And so you get these gray area issues, and that's happening right now with crypto because the FTC... The future trade and commodities, they don't know uh, IRS. They all have differing opinions on what it even is. Well, that'll settle down. It'll get a more stable. It'll become a more stable. It's early in its product life cycle. It'll become a more stable market. Regulation will be there to try to control it. It'll be a lot different than it is now. But it will be technologically better. That's the path that we've seen so far. It will be cheaper. It will be more available. And that system is one that today there seems to be a tendency to just criticize it, I think, without just cause. It almost just seems like a hip thing to do. And yet it flies in the face of all that evidence. And usually the way that this happens is they'll find one thing, they'll say, there's this one problem with the system. And it, it's probably a very real problem. And they'll say, because that one problem, the whole thing should be scrapped. And that's a really poor way of thinking about it because usually that problem, what economists call market failures, it's just the result of not having information. We're still not to a perfect information world. And markets, to optimize, it is known that information drives that process. The other part of it is that humans make mistakes. This is where self-driving cars have shown just how much more effective they can be. Again, one car accident or one person killed and it's a huge news story, and people were calling for Elon Musk to be prosecuted because of Tesla autopilot. Meanwhile, today on the roads, dozens of people will die just because a human was daydreaming, dozing off, miscalculated something. When humans make mistakes. Humans are a big part of the firms and households. We're getting more and more machines, but this is a system about people, and people make mistakes. Now, the, other, the place that this usually gets extreme is with profit. And in some cases, the word profit is a four-letter word to people. It is something to be reviled, something to be uh, even prosecuted for. Have special laws written because you're too profitable. That's actually how the world had been before the 250-year time shift that I'm talking about. Within the Western tradition of Judeo-Christianity, usury meaning lending money for interest, is very prohibited and changed over time. And about 250 years ago, one of the things that changed fundamentally was this idea that you could have capital and you could make interest on capital. And you could then share capital across these, this growing group of exchange of humans, this economy. And all of a sudden, we get rapid world development, a hundredfold increase in the quality of life. Profit's a big part of that. And if you look at Apple today, they've had, you can go to the data, it's down there in the bottom left at that link. 
They've had, on average, over the last five years, 39% profit margin. That's massive. And 400 years ago, they would have gotten hauled in front of the king's court to explain themselves. And I think it's because there's two places that profit can come from. And so when people are criticizing profit, they're pointing to one that is, is a real problem, and it's fraud. If the only reason that you can get more out of an exchange is because you have some sort of power or some sort of uh, proprietary asymmetrical information, you know something that the other person doesn't know, and so you're basically defrauding them. That information isn't freely exchanging or the truth would be known, and then the person could still decide whether or not to exchange based on that truth, but there's a component of it that is missing. And this goes all the way up to things like Ponzi schemes. That's all fraud in economic terms. When the exchange isn't fair, meaning both people don't walk away from it feeling good about it, that is fraud. And you can suck off profit, surplus profit, by doing those kinds of things. That's one of the lessons of the world. Look at how hard the federal government has to fight white-collar crime. Often it's people in close networks who are defrauded by someone they trusted and knew it's not just strangers who are forcing you to come do something, to work against your will or to buy a product against your will. And I say that with Apple because clearly that 39% profit margin, is a, it comes from the second place the profit can come from, which is you add real value. People don't stand in line for the iPhone because it does not add value to their lives and they're being scammed. They love that device, maybe too much. I have had a student that told me about this. This is how I found this article. If you go down to the bottom left, there's another article link about this guy. It's an accidental entrepreneur who discovered he, was, he had been let go from a job and he was desperate. He discovered that he could make money standing in line and he turned it into a whole business that he has now in New York City. And they make a lot of money every time that there's a new iPhone. They have people who stand in line professionally. They have their own tents made. They've got the branding brilliant. That's all valued exchange. Some people don't have the benefit of time, but they do have more money. And so if someone has less money and more time, and they can make a voluntary exchange of stand in line for me, please, everybody walks away happy. That's a valued exchange. And the profit that matters and the profit that actually drives the world is this one. Because you can't, fraud schemes always collapse. They have a pretty short lifespan, actually, relative to something like a company like Apple or Microsoft or Google, who have been there for decades providing real valued exchange. Okay, so what are some of these economic approaches that you can use to derive those benefits? The number one is profit. You have to focus on profit. This, this shook me to my core coming from the academic world into the business world because in the academic world, in all the economic models, the conclusion is profit. Everything focuses around this. And profit in mathematical terms in economics is identical to the idea of cost minimization. So often people who are uh, very against the idea of profit are very in favor of the idea that you would do as much as you could with as minimal impact as you could meaning your costs are as low as possible. There's no waste. That is mathematically the same motivation in the market. Because you don't want to waste profit. Every bit of waste could have been profit. Because profit is revenue minus cost. And almost all the waste is in the costs. In fact, we're going to go at length into costs. Because cost accounting is another one of those things that just, there isn't enough insight in organizations right now. They can't tie cost down to, say, a specific buyer, a specific customer. Maybe not even to a specific product. Maybe only to whole product lines. That's not good cost accounting, and it means that you're, you have a lot of waste there. And if all you did was just keep the same amount of revenue, but you minimize those costs, your profit goes up. If you can minimize your costs and increase your revenue, your profit goes up doubly. Now, one of the criticisms of profit is often that it, the motivation is to create labor who is being underpaid, underappreciated, and abused. 
And that is one way to keep profit rates up as the product life cycle sets in. And I'm going to talk about that product life cycle in a minute. But that's, that's the actions of a company in their death throes. Because the most important capital that you bring in to production, and I'll get into that also in a moment, is human capital. It is the people. So if you just try to maximize profit by not increasing revenue and just minimizing costs by forcing people to work extra hours under bad conditions, those people will leave eventually. They have enough options in the world that at some point they will leave. And the whole house is coming down already around you. Instead, what you have to do is innovate. Now, another principle of economics that you should be focusing on, especially when you think about KPIs, things that you're tracking, is that there is a tendency for the market, regardless of the actions of any one company, any one consumer, it still has this gravitation to it. It moves towards certain things. And so you should understand that because you're not going to change that individually. And so it, things like seasonality are a good example of this. You don't change seasonality. But that natural equilibrium can be a linear process, so you get there linearly, right? The, the technology keeps improving, so the price keeps falling. That'd be a potentially linear relationship. They could also get there dynamically, nonlinear. So the technology gets better, the price goes down, technology gets so much better the price comes back up and then starts to go down or it could be circular. So predator prey models are a good example of this circular idea in economics, dynamic modeling. But it doesn't go to a static point, it sort of follows a, a rounded trajectory. But you should track and understand everything about these patterns. I said I get to the product life cycle, this is it. Every product follows this pattern. So this chart on the left shows World of Warcraft subscribers from 2005 to 2013. And it peaked in 2010 with 12 million. And it's been sliding down since. If you go to the newer data set, which you can follow from the link there, you'll see it just continues to fall. Should they just market more? Should they... The answer is no, because this is in its product life cycle, it's starting to die. So the product life cycle is usually divided into only three or four phases. You have early, early adoption and innovation, then you start to get broad adoption, then you get maturity, and then you get death. And there's some important inflection points that are in there that you can look for. So things like revenue. Is revenue increasing at an increasing rate? This is the J curve that startups love to talk about. Well, that only happens for the first part. Eventually, it's going to increase at a decreasing rate. And you're going to eventually peak at some revenue level, and then you're going to fall. And that is exactly what you're seeing here with subscribers. Every one of those subscribers has a dollar value tied to them. You can plot that just the same way, and you're going to see the exact same thing in their, in their actual revenue. Now, the time component of this is very important, but there's nothing that says the product life cycle takes 50 years or 20 years. There are brands like Coca-Cola that have been around for more than 100 years, Ford. There are also brands that just came into existence and disappeared overnight. Maybe may have even had some success for a while and then just disappeared. But every product is going to follow this. And so in that death phase, if all, of World, if all World of Warcraft did right now was just force their engineers to do more work, fired a bunch of them, forced a few of them to stay on, made them work even longer hours, um, and just to try to keep their profit rates up despite the fall in users and revenue, then those engineers will very quickly go find another job. The only way to avoid this is to create a new product. And that's why you see brands like Apple go from computers to iPods to phones to houses and cars right now. They're innovating new products so they can fight against this. This is a natural equilibrium. This is a momentum that's, that is in force in the economy and no one person can change it. Now, economists call all the things in your supply chain that you use, so the land that you rent or own, the building that you rent, the humans that you have, the machines that you have, they call those factors. 
and they each have their own market. That's why they're distinct. That's why they make the distinction. There is a market for engineers, and World of Warcraft has to go to that market to buy engineers, and that's why they can't just keep repressing them, or they'll lose them. There's a market for capital investment. There's a market for land. These are all things that you have to go as a business into to buy from. So these could be your B2B relationships in some cases. And all of those things are going to have different types of costs associated with them. And this is a place, that it's not easy to control whether or not someone purchases you. That's a marketing and sales issue. Uh, it really comes down to do you serve a real human want, need, or, or value add. If you do, and you have a clear buying process and a good customer experience, they will purchase from you. But you can't force them to. You can control your own costs. And just knowing them is the first step. Now, if you do not have a holistic view of all of the cost, so there's something called the spiral of death in cost accounting, where if you look at the product level a certain way, and you are looking at things like averages, and you're trying to figure out, you know, specifically margins on each product, the product group, and you find one that didn't ha doesn't look so great on paper, and you cut it, and you lose all that revenue, and then it changes all the ratios for the other things you're looking at, and now another one doesn't look so good, so you have to cut that one, and then pretty soon you don't have any products left because it's not profitable to sell any of them. If you that is a known issue, and it's, again, because of information. If you knew how every piece of your cost was actually contributing to your production, which is the theory of economics, how do each of these things that we buy, these factors, the person, the engineer, how do we make sure that that engineer gets exactly as much pay as they add value to the company? No more, no less. That's really hard to do. You don't have that great of information, so mostly you're looking at averages. But you should track them over time. You should understand them over time. Another force of the economy that you're just going to have to deal with is the fact that everything has diminishing returns. This looks a lot like ShapeWise, the product life cycle. It's the same idea there. But we're talking about individual contributions now. So if you just hire a whole bunch of engineers, at some point there's not enough work for them to all do or they can't coordinate, or they don't have enough desks, and so you have <coughs> excess capacity just sitting there being wasted. Similarly, you could have one engineer and you just buy a huge amount of servers and that one engineer can't ever get them all set up, and now you have wasted capacity. You have to balance all of those factors simultaneously in production. That's not easy to do, and no matter how much you want to scale up a process that works, there's going to be diminishing returns. At some point, coordination is going to break down. At some point, um, scale itself starts to hurt you and you get less out each for each dollar you put in. It's really important to pay attention to when diminishing returns are setting in. In marketing in particular, there's this mentality that if it worked, if $10,000 worked, $100,000 is gonna really work. That is not correct at all. Ahead of time, just assume it's gonna follow this distribution. 20,000 might work, 30,000 might still work really well, but after maybe 40 or 50,000, you're getting less and less out. You're getting revenue, but it's less and less, and at some point then it just turns strictly negative. Now you spend and you just don't, you hit a ceiling. And people say this all the time about AdWords or Facebook. They're like, it was working great, and we just hit a ceiling. And they're very surprised by it. Well, they shouldn't be surprised by it, because diminishing returns is gonna set in. Now, within economics, you're, again, you're one of those tiny little grains of sand in this big economic beach. Well, a bunch of the other grains of sand are competing with you. And if you aren't paying attention to them, that is a big mistake. In fact, most economic models assume that in a competitive market, you know everything about your competition, down to their exact price, because if you could price for just a penny lower, you'd capture the entire competitive market. But if your competitor knows that you're going to do that, then you both price at the lowest you can each go, which are tied to the supply chain you buy, which you are limited by your individuals. There's only so much you can negotiate on, and so you hit a competitive outcome. 
very few markets are actually that competitive. Most of the time, most of these verticals have a handful at best of competitors, and two to three of them are the real power players. Look at search as a good example. Google has, what, 60% of the domestic market, 80% worldwide of search. After them is Bing, after them is who? You probably don't even know. It's very, very small amounts. So to even call them competitors might not be accurate. So the more you can learn about these competitors, the better. I've said this in other lectures, product, price, message, and channel. You should focus on understanding what their product is, you should understand the pricing that they have, you should understand the channel mix they're using to attract and find customers, and the relationships that they have with those customers, and then you should look at their messaging. You can go on their Facebook, you can stalk them on Twitter. There's also tools that will help you aggregate some of this information and so that you can have a monthly picture, month to month of what is going on. That doesn't mean that you have to guide your entire strategy by this information. It just means that this information is available if you need to guide strategies. And you, you can really up the power of your decision making by bringing in game theory, but that requires that you have information on your competitor. Most game theory is not about how you as an individual are just going to behave. There's some games that are like that, that you're playing against machines or other unknown people, and that, you know, your choices as an individual are being measured. But most of the game theory that is of interest to people, the kind of John Nash, beautiful mind stuff that people are interested in. It's about how groups of people or different nations or different uh, individuals driving a car at each other, how they're going to act. So you, again, have to have information on that other person. That other person is your competitor. And specifically in economics, there's something called duopolistic models. There's two. There's a Bertrand version, and then there's the Cournot. I think the Cournot is an easier one for people to get introduced to. But you, knowing competitor strategies, can bring that information into a model that tells you your best response given whatever your competitor does. So if you have that flow of information monthly and they do something like change price or change product and you've got that modeled out in your organization, you can see what your best response would be by looking at this, but you have to have that data on them. One of the real powerful lessons of the last 50 years in economics was the, was the role of expectations, both on the consumer side and the business side. It is not just what is happening in the market today that matters to people. It is what they think is going to happen tomorrow. And when they lose confidence in the future, things unravel really, really fast. And so the 1970s is a odd decade for economists because up until that point for about three decades they had very accurately been predicting year over year things like inflation and unemployment and they they got to almost hubris about how well they were guiding the economy people call this the golden era of economics and they often attribute it to this guidance um, the Phillips curve is an important piece that was used in that and then all of a sudden it just didn't work anymore and things that the model said shouldn't be able to happen started happening. And the whole economy started to unravel. People were standing in line to get gas. There was rationing. There was huge unemployment. There was a huge increase in interest rates because of inflation. To the point that an economist coined the term the misery index and started tracking that metric as a net metric of how bad things were. So all of a sudden those models just broke down. Why? Well, it was expectations. And on the consumer side, this is where your CX strategy comes in. You just need to be understanding their preferences, how they make choices. Those are core tenets of microeconomics. Now, they change quickly, but they're rarely extreme. So people do not like extreme values. They, they tend to steer away from them. It's one of the things that you can include in your modeling. They don't just want one feature. They want a mix of features. They don't just want one choice option for payment, they probably want a range of payments options. Which means you better be really dialed in on understanding the preferences. This is where discrete choice modeling comes in, specifically designed for that, to understand those preferences because they can change rapidly. Now on the business side, expectations are usually tied to profit, future profitability. And you can discount money in the future to in today's terms, both using just a discount rate, 
Meaning if I instead I took $100,000 and put it in the bank and I was able to get a 10% return, I'd have that versus what you'd have to pay me in the future and that's only worth this to me now. It's a, it's a complex relationship once time starts coming into this. But it's really important because expectations, deflating it by expectations gets you closer to the real values. And I think sales in particular has this problem. They look at a deal and they say it's a $100,000 deal. And few of them are discounting the value of that deal in real terms, given the probability that it will actually close. Some of the tools, Salesforce, HubSpot, they're starting to integrate this, but you enter the probabilities. So how do you know what they are so that nobody enters them? You have to track them over time and start to actually validate them, and then you can put them into that system. But a $100,000 deal that only has a 30% chance of closing is only worth $30,000 in revenue to the organization in expected terms. And if you have a need for $100,000 that month, then you need to get your expected value up to $100,000. Not the, we got one deal at $100,000 that's going to save us. And to show you how far off this can be, there was a pair of economists who used some uh, crime database information from both the US, from the FBI, and from this British association. You can go to the link down there and read all about it. It's pretty interesting work. Their conclusion was that robbing a bank has an expected return of $4,300, which is shockingly low to people. You can tell them that value. Everybody thinks that they're going to get away with just bags of money. Everybody has the movie Heat in their, seared in their collective memory, just duffel bags just stuffed with cash. And the chances are that, no, it's more likely you're going to be $4,300. Now, for every individual criminal that you add to the gang, you can increase it by 1800 but diminishing returns will set in. As you increase more and more to keep getting that additional 1800 the average amount that is shared across all the criminals goes down, and at some point they start to drop off. Now, this data also masks, you know, I've warned about this in other lectures about how to interpret data, these are average values. What actually happens is 99% of the time the person gets caught. And 1% of the time they get away and they get away with a lot. And so it averages down to 4,300, but the reality of the situation is you're probably gonna get caught. But if you don't, then there's this huge payoff. And that's probably why it continues to exist. Knowing your customer their expectations, their preferences, their choices is, is core to your success as a firm in a market economy. This is the revenue. This is the closest to revenue control you can get. Really understanding these customers, making sure that they understand what your product is and that it's going to add real value to them because if not, they'll just unsubscribe really quickly and you've spent all this money to market to them and you develop product features around them because they were telling you ahead of time they wanted them and then they got there, it wasn't what they wanted and they bailed and you get no more money from them, just costs, just a whole bunch of fixed costs in the form of servers and variable costs in the form of engineers. The closest you can get to revenue control is making sure you really understand your customers. Now, in, e in economics, we call these representative agents. In marketing and in most of the Dawn of the Data Age lecture series, we call them personas. These are groups of individuals that collectively capture their broad behavior. They're also dissimilar from one another, so within any group they're as similar as possible, but between groups they're as dissimilar as possible. And in economics, you create these representative agents because you want to do simulation with them. And the lesson has been that with five, you can get to about 99%. You're capturing the behavior predictably of 99% of the system. You're understanding 99% of what is going on with these customers. Now the real value add is if you can get that one more percent because they're usually so high value talk about the Pareto principle that the re return for them is really really high and you didn't get to them because of diminishing returns of information you got to them because you just haven't learned who they are individually yet there's actually a gain still to be made there but with representative agents with those personas with five groups, you can then create agent-based models is the main method that's used in economics. These are like Tron worlds. You have a set of equations that describe the world. 
and how it functions. And then within it, you have five representative agents or five personas, your customer types. And you have them modeled out with equations. And you have rules about how they interact with each other and how they interact with the environment. And then you add in some elements of shocks or chaos or randomness or specific paths that you want to consider. And you run millions and millions of iterations of this process. And you get all these different values and then you estimate the, um, parameters and say, this is how the system overall seemed to behave. This is where it converged to. Given all this randomness, all this shock, this is the natural equilibrium that it gravitated towards. And if you use that, it is usually highly, highly predictable. Especially if the data that's being included comes from behavioral things, choice-based from those customers, which you can do with survey experiments like discrete choice that we talked about. Now the power of these KPIs, the information you have to remember comes to the organization in the form of a KPI. That's what everybody calls them. Key performance indicators. That is the perfect information that you're trying to understand as a organization. Most of these KPIs right now, things that are being used are not the best metric at all. In fact, I predict that there's going to be, I should say, I'm jumping on the prediction bandwagon, that there's going to be this huge collapse in the next few years of businesses who are dying out to their direct competitors because they haven't been efficient, they haven't been focused, they're not serving the needs of the market. They don't understand their customers and their competitors are going to do it and they're going to capture a huge part, portion of the market. They're going to make it a more competitive-like market. And so their power in that market will go up and they are going to either buy or kill a lot of their competition. Amazon's leading the way on this right now. But it's going to happen at less dramatic levels too. It's going to happen in the small lifestyle business world where you've got maybe five firms in the city that are all doing the same thing. They all know each other. Two of them are struggling, so two of the others buy those. Now you're down to three, and then one decides that they've got a big enough share of the market, they just buy them all. They become one organization. Okay, well, four out of five of those businesses don't really exist anymore. They got subsumed into something else. And I think that's about the rate it's going to be. 80% are going to go away. We're just going to see this concentration at every level of business. And it's the ones who are doing the buying are going to have profit because they have leveraged their data. They understand the real situation better. They can do more game theory modeling and outcompete. And as a result, they'll grab all that market share. And so that's laid out in this LinkedIn article that you can go through with that one. All right, so how to, let's bring this all home now. How do you wrap up all these different concepts? And I've only scratched the surface with these. I gave the ones that I think are the most important. Diminishing returns is really important because it applies to your life. No matter what you do, you're going to hit these diminishing returns. Just watch and you'll start to see. That's important because then you stop throwing resources into that. You can start to think about things like innovation. You've got to be paying attention to costs. They're within your control. You've got to understand the customer if you're going to drive up your revenue. Both of those things will increase profit and that's the ultimate KPI that you are after. Because in the market economy, it is what guides all those natural equilibrium. And you can understand that through data collection, data modeling, simulation. But there's, a, there's some core principles that under, underlie all of these things that I've covered today. The first is that this is a study about humans. And I think this is where most people who've had econ classes get a disservice done to them because they leave thinking that the only thing that you have to look at is price and quantity. Because that's what's in all the charts that they look at. You've got price on one axis, quantity on the other, supply and demand curves, cost curves. You're just looking in at everything through those two lenses. And that's because, like other KPIs, economists are just like businesses today. Businesses today pick their KPIs because they're easy to grab not because they were necessarily the best. It did turn out that price really is a good one. But they were picked by economists a few hundred years ago as the, as the metrics of focus because they were easy to see. You could walk into a marketplace, a real marketplace, where you had you know, shops, and you could count things up and ask how much stuff was being sold for, 
and talk to customers, you could start to estimate prices. And you could get a measure of the relationship between quantity and price. And that's where they discovered this downward relationship. If you offer a lower price, you can sell a higher quantity. But on the flip side, to sell a higher quantity requires more costs. And so it requires a higher price to motivate you to supply more. And it's the balance of those two things that hits that natural equilibrium. It's all people behind that. Why is someone buying something? That's a preference. What's the customer experience of the process? What are the competitors that they consider during that stage of their customer journey? If you just focus on price and quantity, it's economic quicksand. You just you get surface level understanding and you never get out of that. You have to move into those deeper micro models. And this is really useful in the customer experience space. So if you are a CX manager or you have a CX or UX role, I highly recommend that you start to read about the behavioral economics. The field of behavioral economics is very focused on this idea that it is about humans and their behavior and how, how you study that. Another is to focus on first principles. You do not have to go get a PhD in economics or a master's in economics to think like an economist and be effective with these tools. I highly recommend the Freakonomics podcast. Um, I highly recommend the ACDC Leadership YouTube channel. I'm going to talk about that. That's one the source that I'll give you here at the end. But first principles are, are foundational, and you can learn all of these in six weeks. And there's a lot of open source material available for you to do that. And the reason that I encourage you to start here is that you're going to capture most of what is behind. You're going to good foundation most of what's behind the current economic models of any stripe. And so it's a good, it's a good broad first step. The other is that you have to be validating empirically. And this is data. This is why I got into data. Economists are great econometricians, they're great statisticians, and that's because they have calculus models with parameters in them, and they want to know what those parameters realistically are in the world, and so you go out and you collect that data, and you run through econometric models, and you get parameter estimates, and then you plug them into your calculus equations, and you can watch how the system performs. But information is secondary to that human capital, and you have to have systemized tests in place for this. If you don't, you're going to do things like cut the wrong cost because you didn't understand what was going on and start the spiral of death. Another lesson of economics, an economic way of thinking for you to adopt, is that it is okay to fail. Again, this is where the moral judgment component, when you're looking at price and quantity only, you just look at why they fail. You don't look at you know, the human flaws necessarily behind it. You just say, oh, their average cost, they couldn't cover their average variable cost and they had to shut down. That frees you from some of the other issues tied to failure and allows you to then try again because one of the lessons of economic history is that persistence has paid off far more than any single stroke of luck. This idea that uh, it is just luck is based on a probability approach that does not take into account that for some of the people, they had multiple attempts in a random draw because they kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. And that increased their chances. Persistence pays a lot. And so if you can get over the fear of failure and you just get through these efficiently, one wave after the other after the other, you will more than likely get to the outcome, the natural equilibrium, and that's where things will be in economic terms, optimal. And finally, I've said this many times, focus on efficiency. Efficiency in cost, efficiency in revenue generation, efficiency in servicing that revenue. Data is the way to understand this. But there are, there are limits even on efficiency. And this, this notion of efficiency, by the way, comes from nature. This is not just, economists did not just make this up and say, it'd be great to be efficient. What they observed is that, at the same time, naturalists who are looking at the world are saying, the world is highly efficient. In fact, the Fibonacci series shows up in the natural world. Why? There's something efficient to that successive, the ratio of successive numbers, and it converges, its limit converges on that golden ratio. So we're back to, there's some sort of natural efficiency drive 
that guides some of these outcomes, and you see it everywhere. So you can do this kind of trick, and some of them are definitely tricks, not actual outcomes, of putting Fibonacci spirals on different things in nature, and you see these systems. So one that is highly efficient are um, sunflowers. So if you look at the distribution of sunflower seeds, they are aligned in a way that converges to this golden ratio, and that's because it maximizes the amount of seeds that can be put on one area. And then beware lock-in. This is this is an unexpected great lesson of economics for me. That people are very slow to change, but technology moves very quickly. And this can create a system where you get dependent on maybe a really outdated technology. I've been seeing some stories about how the US military is too dependent still on Windows XP. And it's because it's just so hard for them to change systems. That's called technological lock-in. One of the disputed examples of this are QWERTY keyboards, that this keyboard system that we use today is not necessarily the most efficient for typing because it was naturally limited when it was first used for typewriters because it was a physical component of a swinging, I don't know what you even called those things, hammers, tied to each key. And they could jam up, so they laid them out. That's the pseudo myth, and if you dig into it, basically what you find out is it's true, there was some sort of technological lock-in to why we have this, and getting everybody in the world to change to a different keyboard right now is just not realistic, even if it would have efficiency gains. People are just going to fight it and fight it and fight it. Instead, the better approach is, well, you get brain-to-computer interfacing and nobody has to type anymore, and that efficiency, inefficiency goes away through the innovation. Now, this kind of lock-in thinking can always be spotted by the phrase, that's just the way we do it. So if you ask a question like, why are we doing... Why do we have these five campaigns set up in AdWords? And someone says, oh, those are just the ones we've always run. That's not an answer to that question. That's a sign that there's some sort of lock in there, that they don't even want to look at it. There's no empirical test of it to see, to scrutinize it. And so you could start to dig into it, and if, you, again, you don't understand the connection from those top-of-the-funnel ads to an actual customer purchase, I wouldn't recommend just going in there and slashing everything that's not performing at some arbitrary level. But you need to understand it first and then map it to the other stuff in your customer journey. And then you can find the ads that perform, do not perform at all and that you can cut. But it takes that holistic view of the data. All right, so let's recap and then I'll give you that reference for the day. We talked about the benefits of using this kind of thinking in business. It is the real world. It does describe the system. It keeps you focused on all the connections. I talked about various economic approaches that you can use. I recommend you go back and look at these slides. They'll be on SlideShare, or you can email me and I'll send you a higher res version. The video of this lecture will get posted to YouTube so you can watch it again there. I think you should go through those approaches a few times, and maybe even as I talk about one, pause, go online, do a little bit of rabbit hole digging, you know, give yourself 20 minutes for each slide, and you will really understand those concepts and how they fit into economics. And this will get you on the way to starting to think like an economist. And so I, I picked the reference today because I think this guy, who was a high school teacher, by the way, an AP high school econ teacher, who started a YouTube channel. And if you go look at the actual YouTube channel, like you look at the videos and you align them by date, you'll see that he just started by filming himself in front of a whiteboard. A low quality bad lighting, can not always hear really well, but it was there, the material was there. People, I have students in my university classes, every time I show a video from this guy, everybody knows who he is. They've all used him to understand economic concepts. He's brilliant, the, there are also higher, uh, higher res versions of his presentation. So he'll do like some of these whiteboard videos, but then he'll do one in the studio that's high quality quick cuts, music, and that's mostly what people watch are those, those key videos, but there's dozens of them. There might even be more than that. You can understand a lot of economics by just going and digging through this guy's YouTube channel. And in particular, I would start with this video. And this is one of those lower quality camera in a room whiteboard videos. But he explains that big circular flow in a lot more detail. I, I've touched on, you know, surface level stuff to just get going into the economics component today, but he really lays out the whole dependencies and systems and the exchanges that take place. And 
And that's important because that's how you start to understand all of the big picture, the whole system. That's how you understand those dependencies. Once you understand those dependencies, now you have a KPI to track. Then you can actually track those KPIs. Then you can analyze those KPIs. You can figure out what is or isn't working. Then you can start to use simulation to figure that out. And then you can start to actually implement it and verify it. And you can outcompete your competition because you're generating more profit because you're using these economic principles. All right. For our final, and next, uh, the next one is our final in the Donna's Data Age lecture series. We're going to continue to do lectures. We're going to do them in a slightly different format than what we've been doing for the last year, but that's what we're going to do next time is recap the main things that we have covered in this year doing these lectures. All the frameworks that we've talked about, customer journeys, customer personas, customer lifetime value, all these economic frameworks. All the data science specific stuff, the different data science roles, creating a data culture, interpreting data, uh, types of data. We, we're going to dig back into some of the role specific things, the CX stuff that we've covered, the product management stuff we've covered, the sales stuff we've covered, and the marketing stuff that we've covered. And really recap how all of that is creating this, this data age that we are firmly now into. So. We'll see some of you there June 21st, 2018. You can go to that normal lecture landing page in paratos.com forward slash lecture to register. Have a great day.